We've come to chapter 5 in Charles Williams' book, Descent into Hell. And this chapter is entitled, Return to Eden, which gives us a clue to uh, a chapter that will kind of deal with Adam and Eve, uh, two individuals, uh, lovers or whatever, and, um, and, and we will see how it plays out. Uh, when I first read the book, I remember this chapter being kind of creepy because it, uh, it moves along toward Wentworth, uh, Mr. Lawrence Wentworth, developing somehow in his mind or creating through some uh, evil means uh, an apparition uh, of Adela. And, um, and that apparition will connect herself to him and uh, he will kind of live in this illusion. Um, and it, it just was kind of strange. Uh, but the more times that I have been through the book, um, the more I see what Charles Williams was trying to say about narcissism uh, leading us to hell. That, that hell is the place where you're by yourself and you've rejected everyone else. And uh, you're the only person that matters. And that's what's beginning to happen to Lawrence Wentworth. The chapter opens by discussing the fact that Lawrence Wentworth uh, had never really considered the poor and oppressed who lived in the Republic with him. Their needs were of no concern to him, and he didn't acknowledge them. And um, so um, he uh, he's in a position where he, he all through his life, uh, has never opened his eyes to see the world and the hurts of other people. And because he's gotten to a position where he can uh, order people around as a, as a military commander and he can draw up plans about where they go and what they do, um, he's never able to really think about it from the point of view of the, the soldiers that fight and those who are, who are living through the realities that he's just creating. Uh, on his drawings and so forth. So you have that, um, and then you get to page 56, and uh, we're, we're introduced to um, the fact that he's standing in his bedroom and looking out, and, and he's thinking something's going to come, and his mind is beginning to kind of look that something's got to happen here, and that, that he wills to happen. But he doesn't realize that right beside him uh, is the dead man. And they're both peering out. <laughs> they're both peering out. They're both, both looking for something. And uh, so, whereas Margaret Anstruther was able in a vision to see uh, beyond the veil and see the dead man, Lawrence Wentworth, uh, in this moment here anyway, um, is not able to cross that barrier and see it, but it's it's going on right beside him. But because he's he's you know saying something's got to happen here, uh, we're told that there's evening and morning the first day, which harkens back to the story in, in Genesis. And um, then we're told that he meets um, Adela out in the street, and she's with you, and. Adela and him kind of look at each other and smile. And um, there's a, uh, William says their greeds smiled. They're, they're both hungry to use each other. And, um, and then they have a conversation and, and uh, Lawrence Wentworth wants to show Hugh that he's not been taken in. He knew that they were together. Um, and so uh, they recount the story of how they happened to meet each other that Thursday night when they didn't come to his, uh, his house for the regularly scheduled uh, every uh, other week uh, time with the young people. And um, so he goes home from that encounter and he's angry, Wentworth is, and um, he's looking down at the, the drawings that he's been making for the costumes of the Grand Duke's Guard for the play. And uh, he's quite willing to just give up on everybody else but in the back of his mind, he realizes he, there's a person he can't give up on, and that is Catherine Perry. She's going to have those drawings no matter how hard she has to press him to get them. 
and he sees that she's a, a foe that he can't face, so he's going to come up with those drawings. But he's angry, and he happens to kind of cast aside those drawings, and then below are the first drafts, and he tears them up, you know. And um, then, it's just the chapter so humorous, while he tears them up, he looks on the desk there, and there's the morning paper, and he hasn't opened it up, it's still rolled up. And um, so kind of unconsciously, he opens the paper, and <laughs> looks down, and there's a little blurb there about his rival, Aston Moffat, uh, being given a knighthood in history. And he just goes berserk, you know, um, rather than being thankful that someone in his profession is receiving this, um, this extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, thing, this knighthood, uh, he, uh, he just, in a fit of jealousy about it. He, you know, I'll, what's the chance that they'll give another knighthood for history for years? You know, so like the, the idea is just brought up and withdrawn, the possibilities withdrawn all at once. And uh, Williams makes the point that uh, as he goes through this process, you know, he puts this paper aside, he opens back up and looks again, and he just, it's just infuriating him, that he is given the opportunity to begin to process this. He's, he's given the opportunity to be joyful for someone else, to be beyond himself, to be less selfish, at least even for his profession. Uh, he's, he's been given the opportunity to just put it aside. And uh, even, even then, there might be a possibility that, that this won't draw him down toward ta damnation. But he rejects those things. He, he, he refuses those things. He willfully decides he's going to be angry and jealous uh, and envious and, and full of hatred for his rival on the basis of this. So he rejects the joy. Um, and then, uh, you know, after all this happens, um, he's looking out and some figure comes to him and it looks like Adela and sounds a little like Adela. It's not really Adela. He doesn't know what to make of it. And this figure meets him and, and says, come away with me. And he takes off with her to he doesn't know where and uh, they're in a conversation, and she says, you don't think about yourself enough. And right away, the reader ought to be clued in, you know. These are, the, the, the devil is the father of lies. You know, you don't think about yourself enough. You know, the ultimate lie there. And he goes through, well, of course I don't. I don't, I could do so many things if I just thought about myself more, you see. And then he's, he's taken away, and a door opens, and he, he doesn't know where he is. Later on, we'll know a little bit about this place up at the cemetery where this lean-to shed and where this uh, Lily Samil is and this, this Lilith creature that she has become or whatever. Um, but he goes up there and, uh, and this uh, being says to him, it's good for man to be alone. Another lie, you know, a, a corruption of Genesis where, you know, we're told clearly in Genesis it was not good for man to be alone. But, but this figure says to him, it's good for man to be alone. And uh, it says, come further on and further in. Um, both uh, uh, George MacDonald, who, who will kind of use that kind of language, and C.S. Lewis uses it. I think it came from George MacDonald in the 1800s. And, and uh, this idea, come further on, further in, uh, you know, and, and it's used here in Battle Hill. C.S. Lewis uses it in a more positive sense when the figures at the end of uh, their experience in Narnia in the, in the last book and, and they've died and they find themselves in this kind of paradise with Narnia. Uh, they come to the city and the uh, gate opens and they're welcomed in and come further on and further in. So that's a joyous use of that. But in this case, in Lawrence Went, uh, uh, Wentworth's case, um, it's devastating. And he's kind of comes in further in to where he's lying asleep. And the language is reminiscent of Genesis because, you know, God puts Adam to sleep and he takes the rib and he makes Eve and, you know, he, he wakes up and poetry, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and all of that. So this Adam sleeps and this 
whatever it is that this creature that comes out of his uh, mind and is created from him, this uh, apparition of Adela comes into being and um, he, uh, he begins to kind of wake up from that. Well, while he's waking up from that and this, he's going to see this creature and follow it and then they're going to go back to his house. Um, in, that, in that moment as he's kind of waking, he kind of has a vision of himself that, and his own body and all of his intestines coiled up everywhere. And then outside of all of that, he sees in the distance this shabby figure walking. And he just jumps up and he says, no, no, no beggars, no hawkers, no, no canvassers, no tramps, you know. And, um, and, you know, it's kind of the dead man. He's kind of given some slight vision of it. Uh, but then, um, then he, he, uh, he comes out the door of this shed out at the cemetery and it swings after him. And doors and gates and windows are so vital in the story. Uh, having to do with these choices that we make in life and the direction we go. And we pass through a doorway or a gate and, and we've moved on in our experience and we either are moving on through the narrow gate, you know, to life or the broad gate that leads to destruction. And uh, it swings after him and he and this figure uh, walk from the cemetery back to, uh, to Lawrence Wentworth's house. And that's how that chapter ends. So keep reading and uh, keep paying attention carefully to what you see. Charles Williams, Descent into Hell, Chapter 5, Return to Eden. Margaret Anstruther had seen in her vision a single house with two forms leaning from the same window. Time there had disappeared and the dead man had been contemporaneous with the living. As if simultaneity approached the hill, the experiences of its inhabitants had there become coeval. Nearness no longer depended upon sequence. The chance that brought Lawrence Wentworth into such close spiritual contact with the dead was the mere manner of his ill luck. His was not worse than others, though the hastening of time to its end made it more strange. It grew in him, like all judgment, through his negligence. A thing of which he had consistently refused to be aware, if action is the test of awareness, drew close to him, that is, the nature of the Republic. The outcast of the Republic had climbed a forlorn ladder to his own death. His death entered into the Republic and into the lives of its other members. Wentworth had never acknowledged the unity. He had never acknowledged the victims of oppression, nor the presence of victimization. It may be that such victimization is inevitable, and that the Republic after its kind must be as false to its own good as the lives of most of its children are to theirs. But Wentworth had neither admitted nor rejected this necessity, nor even questioned and been hurt by it. He had merely ignored it. He had refused the agony of res publica and of temporal justice. Another justice sharpened the senses of his res private. He was doubly open to its approach in his scholarship, where the ignoring of others began to limit color and faults of highest work, and in his awareness of supernatural neighbors, if any should be near, one was. The dead man had stood in what was now Wentworth's bedroom and listened in fear lest he should hear the footsteps of his kind. That past still existed still in its own place since all the past is in the web of life, nothing else than a part of which we are not sensationally conscious. It was drawing closer now to the present. It approached the senses of the present. 
but between them still there were there uh, still there went patter patter the hurrying footsteps which Margaret Anstruther had heard in the first circle of the hill. The dead man had hardly heard them. His passion had carried him through the circle into death. But on the hither side were the footsteps and the echo and the memory of the footsteps of this world. It was these for which Wentworth listened. He had come back into his own room after he had heard those steady and mocking footsteps of Hugh and Adela and the voices and subdued laughter accompanying them. He had himself wandered up and down and come to a rest at last in the finished window where with no wall be to be before him, the dead man had peered. He also peered, he listened, and his fancy created for him the unheard melody of the footsteps. His body renewed and absorbed the fatal knowledge of his desire. He listened in the false faith of desire. It could not be that he would not hear out of those double footsteps one true pair separating themselves, coming up the street, approaching the gate, that he would not see a true form coming up the drive, approaching the door. It must happen. His body told him it must happen. He must have what he wanted because, but still those feet did not come. The dead man stood by him arm to arm, foot to foot and listened. The rope in his hand and that night neither of them heard anything at all. The evening and the morning were the first day. Of a few hours or a few months or both at once, others followed. The business of the hill progressed, the play went forward. Pauline fled and Margaret died or lived in the process of death. He went up and down to the city, Adela went upon the hill. Wentworth now possessed by his consciousness of her and demanding her presence and consent as his only fulfillment went about his own affairs. Blessed is he Whoso uh, ever shall not be offended in me. The maxim applies to many stones of stumbling, and especially to all those of which the nature is the demand for presence instead of the absence, the assent to an absence, the imposition of the self upon complacency. Wentworth made his spiritual voice hoarse in issuing orders to complacency and stubbed his toes more angrily every day against the unmovable stone. Once or twice, he met Adela, once at Mrs. Perry's, where they had no chance to speak. They smiled at each other, an odd smile, the faintest hint of greed. Springing from the invisible nature of greed was in it on both sides. Their greeds smiled. Again, he ran into her one evening at the post office with Hugh, and Hugh's smile changed theirs, charged theirs with hostility. It ordered and subdued Adela's. It blocked and repulsed Wentworth's. It forced on him the fact that he was not only unsuccessful, but old. He contended against both youth and arrival. He said, how's the play going? We're all learning our parts, Adela said. There doesn't seem to be time for anything but the play. Shall we get an, ever get another evening with you, Mr. Wentworth? He said, I'm sorry you could neither of you come. That, he thought, would show them that he had not been taken in. Yes, said Hugh, the word hung ambiguously. Wentworth, angered by it, went on rashly. Did you have a pleasant time? He might have meant the question for either or both. Adela said, oh, well, you know, it was rather a rush, choosing colors and all. But fortunately, we ran into each other later, Hugh added, and we almost ran at each other, didn't we, Adela? So he fed in a hurry and dashed to a theater. It might have been much worse. Wentworth heard the steps in his brain. He saw you take Adela's arm. He saw her look up at him. He saw an exchanged memory. The steps went on through him, double steps. He wanted to get away, to give himself up to them. Life and death, satisfaction of hate and satisfaction of love, lust, contending and the single approach of the contention's result. Patter, patter, steps on the hill. He knew they were laughing at him. He made normal noises and abnormally fled. He went home. In his study, he automatically turned over his papers, aware but incapable of the organic life of the mind they represented. He found himself staring at his drawings of costumes for the play, and it had an impulse to tear them, to refuse to have anything to do with the grotesque mummery, 
himself to reject the picture of the rejection of himself, but he did not trust his own capacity to manage a more remote force than Adela, Mrs. Perry. Mrs. Perry meant nothing to him. She could never become to him the nervous irritation, the obsession, which both Aston Moffat and Adela now were. His intelligence warned him that she was nevertheless one of the natural forces which, like time and space, he could not overcome. She wanted the designs and she would have them. He could refuse but not reject Adela. He could reject but certainly not refuse Mrs. Perry. Irritated at his knowledge of his own fault strength, he flung down the rescued designs. Under them were the first drafts. He tore them instead. The evening wore into night, wore into night. He could not bring himself to go to bed. He walked about the room. He worked a little and walked and walked a little and worked. He thought of going to bed, but then he thought also of his dream and the smooth, strange rope. He had never so much revolted against it as now. He had never waking been so strongly aware of it as now. It might have been coiled in some corner of the room were it not that he knew he was on it in the dream. Physically and emotionally weary, he still walked um, and with scratched images closed on him. His body twitched jerkily. The back of his eyes ached as he stared interiorly from the rope into the backward ab abysm. He stood irritably still. His eyes stared interiorly. Exteriorly, they glanced down and saw the morning paper, which by accident he had not opened. His hands took it up and turned the pages. In the middle, he saw a heading, birthday honors, and a smaller headline, knighthood for historian. His heart deserted him. His puppet eyes stared. They found the item by the name in black type for their convenience, Aston Moffat. There was presented to him at once and, cl and clearly an opportunity for joy, casual, accidental joy, but joy. If he could manage, not manage joy, at least he might have managed the intention of joy. Or, if that also were too much, an effort toward the intention of joy. The infinity of grace could have been contented and invoked by a mere mental refusal of anything but such an effort. He knew his duty. He was no fool. He knew that the fantastic recognition would please and amuse the innocent soul of Sir Aston, not so much for himself as in some unselfish way for the honor of history. Such honors meant nothing, but they were part of the absurd dance of the world and to be enjoyed as such. Wentworth knew he could share that pleasure. He could enjoy. At least he could refuse not to enjoy. He could refuse and reject damnation. With a perfectly clear, if instantaneous, knowledge of what he did, he rejected joy instead. He instantaneously preferred anger, and at once it came. He invoked envy, and it obliged him. He crushed the paper in a rage, then he tore it open and looked again, and again there it was. He knew that his rival had not only succeeded, but succeeded at his own expense. What chance was there of another historical knighthood for years? Till that moment he had never thought of such a thing. The possibility had been created and withdrawn simultaneously, leaving the present fact to mock him. The other possibility of joy in the present fact receded as fast. He had determined then and forever, 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 that he would hate the fact and therefore facts. He walked unknowing to the window and stared out. He loomed behind the glass a heavy bulk of monstrous greed. His hate so swelled that he felt it choking his throat and by swift act transferred it. He felt his rival choking and staggering. He hoped and willed it. He stared passionately into death and saw before him a body twisting at the end of a rope. Sir Aston Moffat, Sir Aston Moffat. He stared at the faint ghost of the dead man's death in that half-haunted house and did not see it. The dead man walked on his own hill, but that hill was not to be Wentworth's. Wentworth preferred another death. He was offered it. 
as he stood there imagining death close to the world of the first death, refusing all joy of facts, and having for long refused all unselfish agony of facts, he heard at last the footsteps for which he had listened. It was the one thing which could abolish his anger. It did. He forgot in his excitement all about Aston Moffat. He lost sight exteriorly and interiorly of the dangling figure. He stood breathless, listening. Patter, patter. They were coming up the road. Patter, patter. They stopped at the gate. He heard the faint clank. The footsteps, softer now, came in. He stared intently down the drive. A little way up in it stood a woman's figure. The thing he had known must happen had happened. She had come. He pushed the window up, careful, even so not to seem too fast, not to seem to want her. He leaned out and spoke softly. He said, is that you? The answer startled him, for it was Adela's voice, and yet something more than Adela's, fuller, richer, more satisfying. It said, I'm here. He could only just hear the words, but that was right, for it was after midnight, and she was beckoning with her hand, the single pair of feet drawn from the double, the hand waving to him. He motioned to her to come, but she did not stir, and at last, driven by his necessity, he climbed down to meet her. As he came near, he was puzzled again, as he had been by the voice. It was Adela's, yet it was not. It was her height and had her movement. The likeness appeased him. Yet he did not understand the faint unlikeness. For a moment he thought he did not understand. He thought he, it was someone else, a woman of, of the hill, someone he had seen whose name he could not remember. He was up to her now and he knew it, it could not be Adela, for ever, even Adela had never been so like Adela as this. The truth, which is the vision of romantic love, in which the beloved becomes supremely her own adorable and ex eternal self, the glory and splendor of her own existence, and her own existence no longer felt or thought as hers, but of and from another, that was aped for him then. The thing could not astonish him, nor could it be adored. It perplexed, he hesitated. The woman said, you've been so long. He answered roughly, who are you? You're not Adela, the voice said, Adela. And Wentworth understood that Adela was not enough, and Adela must be something different even from Adela if she were to be dissatisfactory to him, something closer to his own mind and farther from hers. She had been in relationship to Hugh, and his Adela could never be in relation with Hugh. He had never understood that simplicity before. It was so clear to him now. He looked at the woman opposite and felt the stirring of freedom in him. He said, you waved, and she, or didn't you wave to me? He said under her eyes, I don't think, I didn't think you'd be any use to me. She laughed. The laugh was a little like Adela's, only better, fuller, more amused. Adela hardly ever laughed as if she were really amused. She had always a small conden condensation. He said, how could I know? You don't think about yourself enough, she said. The words were tender and grateful to him, and he knew they were true. He had never thought about himself enough. He had wanted to be kind. He had wanted to be kind to Adela. It was Abdel Adela's obstinate folly which now outraged him. He had wanted to give himself to Adela out of kindness. He was greatly relieved by this woman's words, almost as much as he had uh, given himself. He went on giving. He said, if I thought more of myself, you wouldn't have much difficulty in finding it, she answered. Let's walk. He didn't understand the first phrase, but he turned and went by her side, silent, while he heard the words. Much difficulty in finding what? In finding it? The it that could be found if he thought of himself more? That was what he had said or she had said, whichever had said, that the thing had to be found, as if Adela had said it. Adela in her real self, by no means the self that went with you, no, but the true, the true Adela, who was a part and, and his, for that was the difficulty all the while, that she was truly his and wouldn't be, but if he thought more of her truly being, and not of her being untruly away or whatever way, for the way that went was not the way she truly went, but if they did away with the way she went, then Hugh would, you could be untrue and she true, then he would know themselves too, true and too, on the way he was going, and the peace in himself and the scent of her 
in him and, and the her meant for him in him and that that was the she he knew and he must think the more of himself. A faint mist grew round them as they walked and he was under the broad boughs of trees, the trees of the hill, going up the hill, up to the Adela he kept in himself where the cunning woman who walked by his side was taking him and talking and taking. He had been slow, slow, very slow not to see that this was true, that to get away from Hugh's Adela was to find somewhere and somehow the true Adela, the Adela that was his, since what he wanted was always and everywhere his. He had always known that, yet that had been his hardship, for he must know it was so, and yet it hadn't seemed so. But here in the midst under the trees with this woman, it was all clear. The mist made everything clear. She said, in here, he went in. A wooden door swung before and behind him. It was quite dark. He stood. A hand slipped into his and pressed it gently. It drew him forward a little to one side. He said aloud, where are we? But there was no answer. Only a thought he, heard, he thought he heard the sound of water running, gently a lulling and a lapping. It was not worthwhile against that sound asking again where he was. The darkness was quiet. His heart ceased to burn, though he could hear its beating in time with the lapping and lulling waters. He had never heard his own heart beating so loudly, almost as if he were inside his own body, listening to it there. It would be louder then, he thought, unless his senses were lulled and dulled. Likely enough that if he were inside his own body, his senses would be lulled, though how he got there and how he would get out if he wanted to get out. Why, why fl fly from that shelter, the surest shelter of all, though he could not be quite there, yet because of the hand that guided him round and round in some twisting path. He knew that there were hundreds of yards, or was it millions, of tubes or pipes or paths or ropes or something, coiled, many coils in his body. He would not want to catch his foot in them or be twisted up in them. That was why the hand was leading him. He pressed it for acknowledgement. It replied. They were going downhill now, it seemed he and his guide, though he thought he could smell Adela, or if not Adela, something like Adela, some growth like Adela, and the image of a growth spread in his brain to trees and their great heavy boughs. It was not a lapping but a rustling. He had come out of himself into a wood, unless he himself and the wood at the same time. Could he be the wood and yet walk in it? He looked at that question for a while, for while he walked, and presently found he was not thinking of that, but of something else. He was slipping his fingers along a wrist and up an arm only a little way, for he still wished to be led on the way. Though everything was so quiet, he could hardly think there was any need. He liked going on, away, 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 from somewhere behind, or indeed outside, outside the wood, outside the body, outside the door. The door wouldn't open for, open for anyone. It was his door, and though he hadn't fastened it, it wouldn't open because it, it knew his wish, and his wish was to leave the two who had worried him outside the door. It was fun to think that they were playing games on him when he wasn't there, running around under his windows, and he was quite away, and they would never know, even if he saw them again, where and how and why he had been. It was good for him to be here, and great fun. One day he would laugh, but laughter would be tiring here under trees and leaves, leaves, leaves and eaves, eaves and eaves. A word with two meanings, and again a word with two meanings, eaves and eaves. Many eaves to many atoms, one eve to one atom, one eve to each, one eve to all, eve. They stopped. In the faint green light, light of a forest, faint mist in a forest, a river mist creeping among the trees, moon in the midst, he could see the shape of a woman beside him. He might be back again in Eden, and she be Eve, the only man with all that belonged to the only man. Others, whose names he need not uh, then remember, because they were the waking animals of the world, others uh, were inconsiderable to the grand life that now walked in this, gl this glade. They hardly belonged to it at all. They belonged outside. They were outside, outside the sealed garden. No less sealed for being so huge through a secret gate 
of which he had entered, getting back to himself, he was inside and at peace. He said aloud, I will go back. His companion answered, You needn't go back really, or you can take it with you if you do. Wouldn't you like to? It took a while for this to reach his brain. He said at last, This? All this do you mean? He was a little disturbed by the idea that he might have to go back among the shapes that ran about harsh and menacing outside the glade or the glade or the forest outside the mist. They betrayed and attacked him when it made fun of him and exposed him to her paramour. That was outside. Inside he knew the truth, and the truth was that she was quite subordinate to him. He breathed on her hand, and it was turned into stone, so that she couldn't carry it, but it sank to the ground slowly in that misty air, and she was held there, crying and sobbing, by the weight of her petrified hand. He would go away for a year or two, and perhaps when he came back, he would decide to set her free by blowing on the stone hand. The whole air of this place was his breath. If he took a very deep breath, there would be no air left outside himself. He could stand in a vacuum and nothing outside himself could breathe at all until he chose to breathe again, which perhaps he wouldn't do, so that he could infinitely prevent anything at all from existing merely by infinitely holding his breath. He held his breath for a century or two and all the beasts and shapes of the wilderness, a tall young satyr and a plump young nymph among them, who were dancing to the music of their own chuckles, fell slowly down and died. The women now beside him didn't die, but that was because she could live without air, of which he was glad, for he wanted her to go on living, and if she had needed air, she would have died. He would have destroyed her without meaning to. She was saying eagerly, Yes, 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 better than Eve, dearer than Eve, closer than Eve. It's good for man to be alone. Come along, come along, farther in, farther in, down under, down under. Down under what? Down under where? Down under the air that was or wasn't? But he was there under the air, or the point of breathing out everything that would be just right. Why had he been so long content to have things wrong? It all came out of that silly name of Eve, which had prevented him realizing that he was what counted. Eve had never told him he had made her, and so he wouldn't make her again. She should be left all a twisted rag of skin in the vacuum, and he would have a world in which no one went to the city, because there was no city unless he... But no, he wouldn't have a city. Adela. He found that it had been holding his breath. He released it. He found out he was lying down and that the woman was not there. He had excelled with a deep permission to Adela to exist. Now he was sleeping after that decision and act. He was awake in his sleep. And the moon was pouring itself over him. He wasn't on a rope now. The moon was pouring down quite out of the sky. Presently there wouldn't be any moon, only a hole in the sky, down, down. He felt hands moving over him, the moonlight changing to hands as it reached him, moon hands cool and thrilling. The hands were delighted in him. These were what he would take back to his own world if he went. The moon would always be his, though all the moonlight had poured down now and there was a hole, a dark hole, because the moon had emptied itself of its glory. It was not there anymore. He was at first in the smallest degree troubled, for if odd things could disappear like this, could he be certain that his own Della, Adela would live? Yes, because he was a god. And sometime he would make another moon. He forgot it now. He was quite given up to the hands that caressed him. He sank into oblivion. He died to things other than himself. He woke to himself. He lay quiet. Beyond heart and lungs he had come in the depths of the hill to the bottom of the body. He saw before him in the disappearing moonlight a place of cisterns and broad tanks on the watery surface of which the moon still shone and from which a faint mist still rose. Between them, covering acres of ground, an enormous shape lay, something like a man's. It lay on its face, its shoulders and buttocks rose in mounds and the head beyond. He could not see the legs lower than the thighs, for that was where he himself lay and they could not be seen, for they were his own. He and the Adam sprang from one source. 
High over him, he had felt his heart beat and his lungs draw breath. His machinery operated far away. He had decided that. He lay and waited for the complete creation that was his own. The Adam slept. The mist rose from the ground. The son of Adam waited. He felt coming over that vast form, that hill of the dead and of the living, but to him only the mass of matter from which his perfect satisfaction was to approach. A road, a road up which a shape no longer vast was now coming, a shape he distrusted before he discerned it. It was coming slowly over the mass of the atom, a man, a poor, ragged, sick man. The dead man, walking in his own quiet world, knew nothing of the eyes to which his death day walk was shown, nor of the anger with which he had been seen. Wentworth saw him and grew demented. Was he to miss and be mocked again? What shape was this? And where? He sprang forward and up to drive it away, to curse it lest it inter uh, interpolated its horrid need between himself and his perfection. He would not have it. No canvassers, no hawkers, no tramps. He shouted angrily, making gestures. It offended him. It belonged to the city. And he would not have a city. No city, no circulars, no beggars. No, no, no. No people but his, no love but his. It still came on slowly, ploddingly, wearily. But it came on down the road that was the Adam and the bottom of Eve, determinedly plodding as on the evening when it had trudged toward its death, inexorably advancing as the glory of truth that broke out of the very air itself upon the agonized Florentine and paradise of Eden. Bensem, Bensem, Beatrice, the other, the thing seen, the thing known in every fiber to be not the self, woman or beggar, the thing in the streets of the city. No, no, no canvassers, no beggars, no lovers, and away, away from the city, into the wood in the midst, by the path that runs between past and present, between present and present, that slides through each moment of all experience, twisting and twining, plunging from the city, and earth, and Eve, and all otherness, into the green midst that rises among the trees, by the path upon which she was coming, the she of his longing, the she that was he, and all he and the she patter, the she that went hurrying about the hill and the world, of whom it was said that they, that when she, that they whom she looked over overtook were found drained and strangled in the morning, and a single hair tied around the neck, so faint, so sure, so deadly, the clinging and twisting path of the strangling hair, she whose origin is with man's, kindred to him as he is to beast alien from him as he is to beast, to whom a name was given in a myth, Lilith, or a name and Eden for a myth, and she is stirring more certain the name or myth, who in one of her shapes went hurrying about the refuge of that hill of skulls, and pattered and chattered on the hill, hurrying, hurrying for fear of time growing together, and squeezing her out, out of the interstices of time where she lived, locust in the rock, time growing together into one, and squeezing her out, squeezing her down, out of the pressure of the universal present, down into depth, down into the opposite of that end, down into the ever and ever of the void. He was running down the path, the path that coiled round the edge of Eden, and the mist swooped to meet him. He had got right away from the road that was the shape of the atom, outstretched in the sleep, uh, precedent to the creation of fact, the separation of Eve, the making of things other than the self. He ran away into the comforting mist, partly because he liked it better, partly because there was nowhere else. He ran from sight. He ran from sensation. Arms met and embraced. A mouth kissed him. A sigh of content was loosed to him and from him. He was held, consoled, nourished, satisfied. Adela, he slept. The door swung after him. He was standing on Battle Hill, not far from his house, but higher toward the cemetery, towards the height. There waiting for him was a girl. She exactly resembled Adela. She came toward him softly, reached her hand to him, smiled at him, put up her mouth to him. It was night on the hill. They turned together and went down. After the single footsteps, the double sounded again. His own and the magical creatures drawn from his own recesses. She and him, he and him. He was complacent. They went home.